this session is focused on natural climate solutions. And as CEO of Futera, we've spent 20 years working on the structure and story for solutions. And of course, we love all of our solutions equally. But as you look across the landscape, there is one that comes up again and again uh, to the problems that we're facing. So climate mitigation and adaptation, nature has a solution. Um, economic development with justice and land rights at its heart, nature has a solution. Um, feeling tired and stressed out and a bit weary already from climate week, go for a walk or for an outdoor swim, nature has a solution for us. And even down to, you know, sartorial uh, crisis, wardrobe help, as Johan is uh, ably sporting with his nature top, um, nature has a solution for our wardrobes as well. And I did wonder if it says anything about us or our cultures that Johan has a very kind of lovely, calm, somewhat underwater uh, nature uh, dress, and I've got the leopard print. <laughs> so, moving on from that. Um, all right, so we have, as I say, some of the world's leading experts today to launch um, a really breakthrough new report. Um, so we will be joined by, and in a moment I'll ask um, our speakers to come up, we'll be joined by Michael Wallison, and Michael is the lead author of the brand new Exponential Roadmap for Natural Climate Solutions, which I think Bill needs a woo that we've got this report coming out. <laughs> And Michael will be speaking together with Dr. Starry Sprinkle Hippolyte, who's also a contributing author to the report. So thank you, Starry. Um, now, after that, we're going to have a keynote from Yi Li, who's the VP of Growth and Special Projects at Terraformation. And lastly, we'll be joined by Johan Falk, who's the CEO and co-founder of Exponential Roadmap, and Jenny Arlen, who's the Net Zero Director at the Weeming Business Coalition. So uh, I can't wait to hear from all of our panellists. Before we, in, before we have our panellists join up, I would just like to invite Owen Gaffney, who's the co-founder, come on up Owen, of Exponential Roadmap, um, and also um, Global Sustainability Writer and Researcher at the Potsdam Institute. Um, and Owen, you're going to kind of place us in nature and solutions and introduce the topic. You've got four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for the invitation to speak and it's great to be here to talk to you about Sorry. it. Um, I, I think this report was launched um, yesterday and I think this is the most important r report published this week. Um, and in fact, I would probably go a bit further. I'd say it's the most important report published um, this decade. Mm. Um, because, you know, as Bill Clinton said um, earlier this week, you know, we actually have all the solutions. We know uh, what to do on climate change and even on, on land use, but we don't know the how, how to do it, um, you know, how to accelerate action, how to put it um, in, into place and, uh, and, uh, and exponentially transform um, the systems that we need to. Um, and that's, that's critical. And that is what we have here. Um, for the first time, we have that how, uh, which makes it just um, so incredibly exciting. Um, so, but, f but first of all, you know, I should give you um, news, a sort of an update on the planet and how, how critical, how close we are coming um, to uh, two tipping points in the Earth system. Uh, my colleagues at, Sto at Potsdam Institute and Stockholm Resilience Center um, just a couple of weeks ago published a paper um, in, uh, in the journal Science um, on tipping points. And, uh, and, and we all know here that we, we, the Paris Agreement keeps, one, you know, we have to hold it to well below two degrees, aiming for 1.5 to avoid dangerous climate change. But what um, the paper showed was that we are at danger of crossing five tipping points in the Earth system, uh, five critical tipping points, um, e even at 1.5. And this is new science. You know, ten, ten years ago, um, we thought we'd hit these tipping points, potentially at three degrees or beyond. Um, but now we can see that the danger is very, very close. So it really amps up the uh, energy we need to actually um, stay well, well below two as fast as possible, uh, to, to reduce emissions as fast as possible to get there. And we can't do it um, just by reducing fossil fuel emissions. 
land use is such a huge part of the equation that we will not be able to stabilize at, um, at, at well below um, two without land use. In fact, um, myself and colleagues, Johan Rockstrom and others, published a paper last year showing that of all the trajectories to get us to around 1.5 or just a small overshoot meant that land use had to become net zero by around 2030. In eight years from now, in 100 months, we have to get to net zero. This is, like, this is the ultimate moonshot. This is, uh, this is what we need to achieve um, this decade. And now for the first time, uh, thanks to the Conservation International team, um, we have that. Um, so I'm going to pass over then, back to you, Lucy. Yeah, thank you. And in fact, that's fantastic. Thank you, Aaron, for placing us in that. And now, Michael and Starring, if you'd like to take the stage. Wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. And you have a look. Uh, we're speaking, and we've got a few slides. Um, take a seat. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm Michael Wallace, and I'm the Managing Director for the Exponential Roadmap for Natural Climate Solutions. And I'm clicking forward, and here are my slides. So. It's nice to see some familiar faces. I'd like to start with a few things. First, to say that this project and this report has been a partnership, and we've been working very closely with our partners at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, at the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, as well as WWF with our co-author team. And then, while Owen set the stage so well, I'd like to point out uh, two things uh, before I get started in the substance. And that is that the AR6 report really highlighted two critical facts that we need to keep in mind right now. First is that the window to a safe climate landing is closing, but it is still open. And we need to find the ways to climb through that window as rapidly as we possibly can. The second point that it really drove home is that nature has got to be a major part of the solution. We cannot keep the climate to 1.5 degrees of warming with energy and industrial transition alone. We could turn off all of the coal and gas and cars tomorrow and switch to uh, clean energy, and we would still exceed 1.5 degrees unless we change the pathway for nature. So what we are doing here is incorporating the latest science into what we've introduced as a new carbon law for nature. And this new carbon law for nature is a component of Johan Rockström's carbon law that he introduced in 2017. The carbon law has been a powerful and important uh, milestone that was introduced and really moved the, um, moved the incentive structure for policy, for business, for finance to stop thinking so far in the future. 2050 is not where we need to be setting our targets. We need to cut that problem into steps. Where do we need to be in 2030? Where do we need to be in 2025? In this notion of an exponential growth of solutions and an exponential reduction in emissions has been a critical driving factor in, in moving the policy space forward. So we've tried to do the same thing with nature. While cutting emissions in half every decade, which is the carbon law, will be sufficient to keep one and a half degrees within reach for the energy and industrial sectors, the nature sector, the land sector, can and must do more. We need to get from 12 and a half gigatons of net emissions today to net zero by 2030 for all agriculture and land, and then become a five gigaton sink by 2040 and a 10 gigaton sink by 2050. I'd like to break this down a little bit into pieces because 12 and a half to zero seems like a massive and almost impossible challenge. But nature's different. Nature's very different than uh, oil and coal and, and fossil emissions. Because at the same time, nature is both a source of emissions, but it is also already a sink of emissions. So when we break down the emissions from land, we actually see 23 gigatons. These, some of these figures are in the reports uh, in front of you if you'd like to follow along. This one is not. 23 gigatons of gross emissions from land right now, and we're already uh, sequestering about 10 and a half gigatons per year back into land. And this isn't just the breathing of the earth that we all understand. This isn't just an exhale of carbon dioxide and then an inhale in the same place with the seasons. This is different. This is a source of emissions in some places where deforestation is happening or wetlands are being drained, while at the same time we're reforesting elsewhere. 
that fact that we can do both of these things, we can stop the bad where it is happening, we can increase the good in new places where it needs to happen, and we can both increase the sinks over time and follow this trajectory from 10 and a half to 17, 20 and on, while at the same time reducing the gross sources from 23 where we are today to about 17 in 2030. And 23 gigatons of emissions to 17, now we're talking, that's something we can all wrap our heads around. And in fact, we have a roadmap for achieving not just the 2030 targets, but on into 2050. And that roadmap is what I'd like to talk about now. So the carbon law for nature is where we need to go. That is our destination. The next big innovation in trying to identify how to get there is to refocus natural climate solutions from where we've been, which has been driven by ecologists and geographers and folks who are used to working on the land. We have, we have a tradition in our field, it's not just a tradition, we, we come from, many of us, the expertise of thinking about forests. We think about this forest here is degraded. It could sequester more carbon if we changed our management of it. Or that is a wetland that's been drained and it's emitting methane and carbon dioxide because of what we've done in the past and we can change that. We are used to thinking about land types. But to move into the solution space, to move into accelerating solutions, we need to be thinking about the actors. We need to be thinking about who is on that land. Who are, who are the people making decisions every day about the management of these lands and, and how can they be incentivized to change those decisions, those management decisions? So we've broken down the problem rather than into ecosystem types or land use types, we've tried to break the problem down into actors. Who is on the ground? Who are the people on the land making these decisions? And who are the enabling actors that are setting the stage for those decisions to either push us in the wrong direction or push us in the right direction. And this change in focus to people, we think, is a key to unlocking an acceleration of natural climate solutions in the coming decades. When we focus on people, a different set of solutions start to emerge. And the, this figure is, is in the reports in front of you. These are what we call our action tracks. And they are a set of actually groups of solutions focused on specific actors. And what we've done here is we've arrayed these uh, solution sets from three major categories, protection of natural ecosystems on the left in green, management of working lands in uh, pink in the middle here, and then restoration of natural ecosystems on the right. I wanna point out that this is a land use perspective of, of management and restoration, a lot of folks would actually put the purple way over here because there is restoration that we can do on working lands. You can restore a cropland to have greater health and that is a restoration action. In this report, we're talking about restoration from working lands into a natural ecosystem, reforestation or uh, restoration of wetlands. So this bucket here looks a little smaller than, than a lot of people have in mind, but that's just a boundary issue. So these categories here, the, the climate smart forestry, climate smart Smart grazing, climate smart farming, and the IPLC rights and resources categories. These four, uh, uh, four of the biggest action tracks are really focused on a single actor group on the ground. And how do we break those uh, solutions down into manageable chunks, into NCS models where we know this actor, this incentive structure, this place on the earth where there is a model that's working that we can replicate and accelerate. And this uh, really does add up to the solutions. These circles are sized according to the gigatons of opportunity in 2030, and we need to get moving on all of them to get where we're going. One take home message in our report really focuses on food systems. So I've rearranged our action tracks here with those on the left as closely linked to food systems. And what we see here is when we add up the opportunity of those solutions that are closely linked to food systems, we see that 80% or more of natural climate solutions are either uh, part of the food system or are enabled by changes in our food systems. And this is something that some of our colleagues, WWF is one of our key co-authors on the report, they've been working on this for years, but I think many of us when we think about natural climate solutions are thinking about only the protection and maybe not as much about the management or the diet shift in food waste that has to happen to release the accelerations of these solutions. Um, so this is a critical take home message and, and one uh, I think we need to focus on a bit more. 
The third big innovation in our report, and I've talked about two, the first is the carbon law for nature, a new definition of the destination. The second is a change in focus, a turn in the lens to sharply zoom in onto the people on the land and what we need to do to release those solutions. The third innovation is really putting this on a timeline. So the carbon law for nature tells us what has to happen. It's a top-down view from the integrated assessment models of what the greenhouse gas budgets tell us we need. These curves are a bottom-up view. They take the kinds of literature from our colleagues at the Nature Conservancy, at WWF, NCI, and elsewhere that have added up the opportunity from every one of these action tracks at great detail. How many tons can we get on this place in the earth from this change in behavior? What I would call land accountants. And we have some amazingly good scientists working on this problem. If we take those opportunities and we ask which of those are cost effective, where can we do that at a level of $100 a ton by 2030 or a growing carbon price between now and 2050? And we actually plot out how quickly we need to accelerate those mitigation actions over time. These are the outcome curves. These are the gigatons per year we need from all of these action tracks and solution sets, from protection, from climate smart management, and from restoration into natural ecosystems where they should be. And uh, these curves, what really jumps out at me here is that protection, we need to move absolutely as fast as we can. This curve here has us cutting ecosystem destruction in half every five years for the next 10 years to get to the level of mitigation that we need. And it moves fastest because protection is the, is the most cost-effective one we can do and because it gives us the most co-benefits. There's a hierarchy of mitigation, just like you uh, reduce, then reuse, then recycle. We protect, then manage, then we restore. You, re you use as little as you can. You use what you have to use smartly. And then you take the things you really shouldn't be using and get them back to where they need to be. That's, that's what this hierarchy tell us, tells us. The next thing that jumps out at me is really the massive opportunity in management. And I think this is surprising to some folks, but our working lands are a huge footprint on the Earth's surface. And those working lands have the opportunity to turn from a source into a sink. We can flip that equation if we accelerate uh, changes in behavior in farms, on grazing lands, and in our forestry systems, and in our diet systems. So these acceleration curves are, are the next big innovation. I'd like to also point out that while we are thinking and presenting this work at the global scale to really try to drive ambition forward, we are also trying to operate at the level of spatial detail. And I'm just putting up one map up here. The, the globe is behind here. But these are the mitigation opportunities divided into protection, management, and restoration in gigatons per year in 2030. Uh, and what we see here is, is not a surprise for those of us working in the space. A lot of the protection needs to happen in the big uh, uh, tropical forest areas of the Earth, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, the Malay Peninsula, where we need to protect our ecosystems. But I think it's surprising how much management opportunity there is in those regions as well. Uh, there's a huge amount of cropland in these regions that needs to be managed in a climate smart way to sequester carbon. And there's a lot of opportunity for, for climate smart management across the global north. As we move forward, we'll be digging into this spatial detail. So a few key messages, and then I'm going to pass it to Starry to dig a little deeper into the climate smart management of croplands and grazing lands category. Um, the key messages here that I want to take home, and then I'm going to have one more slide about some next steps before I pass it over. So key messages. To keep one and a half degrees within reach, the carbon law for nature demands that we get from 12 and a half gigatons today to net zero in 2030 and to a 10 gigaton sink per year by 2050. This is a universal yardstick. If you're a company, if you're a country, if you're a city, if you're a bank, you can use this yardstick to guide whether you are on track to deliver in your nature portfolio what the Earth needs from you. This roadmap for natural climate solutions charts the path to achieve the carbon law through, uh, for nature through protection of healthy ecosystems, cutting their loss in half every five years for the next decade, through management of two billion hectares of working lands smarter by 2030, that sounds like an enormous number. It's only 20% of our working lands. So that 20% is a positive tipping point. We can and must get there by 2030. 
We need to restore ecosystems over about 350 million hectares by 2050. Again, these are targets that we've laid out that are doable that people are working on. The next take home message is that a transformation of food systems is critical to unlocking natural climate solutions and delivering on them. And then lastly, the effort needed to deliver this roadmap to deliver natural climate solutions at scale requires us all. Uh, at, at our presentation yesterday morning at the launch event, um, uh, a leader on climate action from McKinsey pointed out that, that the carbon law for nature is asking us to drop 22 and a half gigatons of emissions between now, 12 and a half gigatons net emissions, and 2050 of negative 10 sink. 22 and a half gigatons. That is a massive effort. And while we've laid out the roadmap, no single organization or group of organizations can deliver it. So what we need next to deliver it is really a coalition. And we've mapped out a few different uh, steps forward in this coalition. We need some new basic science. We need to understand what is the climate positive pathway and how does that relate to a nature positive pathway? How do we deliver biodiversity and, and earth resilience by following this roadmap? We have trials and evidence uh, that we need. We need to find and prove what works and what's replicable. We need decision support so uh, leaders in governments and businesses know how to find the opportunity and go after it. And we need to mainstream this idea, this concept that nature both can and must deliver at a planetary and urgent scale. So these are some of the pathways moving forward. And thank you so much. There are copies of the report on some of the, uh, some of the chairs. If you don't like carrying paper around, leave it, and we'll take it and use it uh, for someone else. But if you do, uh, I look forward to your comments. So heading over to Starry for a little bit of work. Starry, we're doing great. Okay, stick to your original plan. Thanks, Mike. And so this exponential roadmap has profound implications for our food systems. And I'm going to dig a little bit into that. So these three tracks within the management pink group, they're big, right? And that's partially because it, they cover 40% of the Earth's surface that is not covered in ice. And also because our, quote, modern industrial agricultural systems are pretty bad for carbon and the environment. This regional map of NCS potential uh, shows that you can see in the global north, as Mike was saying, the fraction of the managed track is much higher. It's over 75% for the entire global north, meaning that we have big changes to make in the way that we are managing our land, which is driven by food production. And uh, so what do we need to do? Um, You've probably heard of regenerative farming by now. And uh, in, in a sense, uh, if you think about extractive modern industrial farming versus regenerative farming, they're very different. The modern farming is reliant on chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And the Climate Smart Roadmap talks about regenerative practices, such as reducing soil disturbance, feeding livestock with crop residues, rotational grazing, and stopping fertilizer overuse and runoff that are not just better for the environment, they actually have huge carbon implications. We know these are the good practices. They will help us win for carbon. I'm going to drill down into uh, the highest mitigation potential in the agricultural land-based solutions sector within this climate smart category, which is also regenerative. And my, my focus, trees and agriculture, also known as agroforestry. So we're talking about integrating just enough trees into croplands and pastures to provide carbon and economic benefits while maintaining agricultural productivity. Very important to maintain food security. There's a lot of really important things to think about when we're applying this natural climate solution to a specific area. We've been asking experts around the world about the ideal arrangements, spacing, and optimal densities of trees in agricultural systems for different agricultural systems. Not just farming and grazing, but the most common types of farming and grazing that we see around the world. In different climates, temperate and tropical, and in different vegetation types. This varies from grasslands to previously forested systems. And it's very essential to underline that we are not changing in this research what is growing where, right? And we are, we are protecting crop yields in that way. We think separately about trees in fields and trees around field boundaries. 
Um, we find that the strategy of adding lines of trees along roads or along the edges of fields is especially promising because it does not displace any current agriculture, so it is, quote, leakage free, right? And uh, the experts also, we asked them, you know, if there are already trees there, why? Why are those trees there? And they gave us many reasons. Not surprisingly, most have to do with the farmer's financial bottom line, right? Trees can increase agricultural yields by improving soil, acting as windbreaks, and improving microclimates. And they can also provide direct additional income, products like timber or fruit, uh, which diversifies the on-farm income and makes it more climate resilient. You might notice that trees can survive extreme weather events like floods or droughts much better than the annual crops can. We also asked these experts what was needed to increase the incorporation of trees into agricultural lands. And besides more research, which was a given, the scientists would say that, right? They actually cite policy development and reform and carbon crediting and verification. Ranking these higher than increased extension services, trainings, or free inputs like trees and tools. The roadmap confirms for us that realizing the huge climate potential within this managed category requires actions by farmers, livestock managers, and foresters, the people who are living and working on the land. But if governments and businesses do not urgently step up to support them, to shift the status quo of agriculture as usual, we won't succeed. Transforming policy, especially farm subsidies, will be critical. Europe has been leading the way in terms of agroforestry policy and supporting innovative science and design tools and subsidy reform to encourage agroforestry. This gives us a model to follow. It's also something to think about as the 100-year-old windbreaks that were put in the Midwestern US and Canada after the terrible Dust Bowl are aging out, dying, and not getting replaced. It's clear that we must build strong coalitions to get this work done. And luckily, there are strong institutions in the world. Uh, we have the World Agroforestry Center, movements like the Global Evergreening Alliance, and we are in the UN decade on ecological restoration right now. And we have increasingly recognition of the role of agroforestry in landscape restoration. Again, restoration is within this category as well, if you can think of agroforestry as restoration, even though it is not restoration to a fully natural system. We see, um, especially in Africa with AFR 100, a lot of momentum gaining around this. Owen mentioned the Tipping Points paper, and just last week there was also the first ever Global Tipping Points Conference mm -hmm. following on the paper. And there were working groups on positive tipping points asking this question, how do we trigger global scale landscape restoration to achieve massive carbon drawdown? And where will it take place? And this includes food security and these implications for food systems. And while these practices might already be more widespread in the global south, we have big changes to make in the global north as well. So here we are at Climate Week. We have a lot of work left to do. Are you in? We're in. <laughs> say that, say that. Um, thank you so much, Michael and Starry. I thought that was just stay. Yes, stay. stay okay, yes, stay, yeah. oh, stay sitting or standing, but stay here for a moment because we'll have some questions from um, the room in just a moment. Um, I thought that was just a fantastic uh, structure for change, like painting the roadmap and the big picture, and then a deep dive into um, trees um, being the solution. So thank you so much for bringing your expertise on that. Now, I happen to know that um, Michael and Starry do actually have some questions for you. So if you would like to avoid that, then put your hand up now <laughs> and ask a question. But if we have a moment to kind of dig into the expertise, a few minutes or so. So um, any questions from the audience? And if not, I've got one waiting as well. All right. So, don't really put your hand up if you had it, get a mo. But um, I did want to ask a, a little bit more about um, tipping points. And I know that you were perhaps interested in hearing from the audience on that I as am. well. Um, could, you ex could you expand on that a little bit? Any other tipping points that you've seen in your work 
um, around um, uh, nature, trees, etc., that you think can rapidly scale us to exponential solutions? Sure. Let me speak first, and then I'll pass it to, to an example, um, potentially, if you have one. <laughs> so I think um, two, two tipping points that I would identify. First of all is a price on carbon. Um, there is no question that the opportunity in natural climate solutions is there. Um, but to create the value, for example, for the climate smart agriculture and climate smart grazing, there is a, essentially a new product line that our rural communities could be selling to the world and providing to the world because they are uh, capable of providing the value of carbon sequestration and storage. But right now, from a policy perspective, we don't value it. We want the corn, we want the soy, we want the cattle, but we don't want the carbon, at least from a policy perspective. And that plays into the finances. It plays into what they care about, which is, as Stari pointed out from surveys, it's the bottom line that matters. So there is a tipping point to come from the policymakers in driving that change. And that's one we need, and we know we need it. So urgently, uh, we need that from policy. Mm -hmm. The other point I would make is that it's not the only tipping point. And in fact, there are opportunities throughout the NCS space, and we need to identify some, where the tipping point really is a new methodology that can already generate positive returns with the existing financial structure. So for example, one of our colleagues, Bronson Griscom, has been working on a model and, and the science behind removing vines from forests where they are overgrown and don't belong, what we call devining. It's a divine model. So this divine model, you actually can pay a crew of, of uh, local communities who need jobs. You can get a, land, a forest manager who wants more board feet of production in their, in their spreadsheet and models. And you can get out there. You can cut those vines down every few years. You need some training. You need some little chainsaws. And that releases the growth of the trees because these vines are parasites. Yeah. And everybody wins. You get jobs. You get more board feet. And you get higher carbon on that forest land for those years between the harvests. Right? That's yeah. a win-win-win. So there are tipping points where we educate and identify and map out the economic models for solutions like that where those can start to spread on their own through existing financial mechanisms. So those would be the two things that I would identify as, yeah. as real tipping points we need. Identify the ones that are self-accelerating, and let's get a carbon price to make more things self-accelerating. And I love how you brought in the, how solving some of these issues can solve so many other pieces as well, economic development, justice, et cetera. Starry. Yeah, well, Mike's covered it really well, but um, one thing I cut out of my speech because I was yeah. trying to respect the time limit uh, are the ambition tipping points that the new tipping points paper points out, where you need to get 20% of all the stakeholders in a sector to start being on board with the transition, and then you get this positive feedback loop between state and non-state actors. So really trying to get to that kind of um, critical mass, perhaps, of, of people that are going forward with it, you know, uh, I think and we do see people adopting these regenerative practices, but they're still the exception, right? They might be 5%, they might be 10%. Mm -hmm. So how do we get up to that 20% where the social scientists say that we can then um, really pick up on them? I'd love to pick up on that a little bit more because the people piece is really kind of coming to the fore in um, all climate solutions. And so at Futera, we've got uh, a mission which is make the Anthropocene awesome in the recognition that if it's us that's got us into this mess, we can absolutely get ourselves out of it again. Um, and earlier I spoke a little bit about structure and story, and it's why we do so much on actually messaging these solutions as well with Nature Conservancy, WWF, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really struck me, um, the, the uh, developments in your report and the carbon law for nature about this new recognition of the need mm. for social science and behavior change, and we've had it coming screaming through in IPCC report six as well. Um, so I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on that, where you see um, some areas where we might be wanting to focus our efforts around bringing people in and, and this new um, look at actually the science of how we create change with people as well. Oh, it's a great question, and I, I, I want to be a little humble because I think I come from one part of the community. I am an ecologist, and I've done a fair bit of work in economics as well, and those are the folks that I've worked with. 
Um, and while there are social scientists out there working on development and natural resources, uh, it, it, it may not be on them that we haven't incorporated their knowledge and their, uh, their learnings into the way we've been thinking about this. So I think there is a lot of good work going on, um, but I do think a little bit of shift of thinking and bringing those folks into the conversations that we're having, where the carbon and the climate outcomes are what we're driving towards, is really a, a critical part of, of moving forward. So that's expanding our circles. It's working with the kinds of tipping points conference, with the social scientists who understand how things accelerate. It means going to businesses, you know, working with Google, uh, working with, uh, with folks who know that an iPhone is going to get to 10% of the market and all of a sudden explode to 80% of the market. So those are the kinds of folks who know how to deliver on the scale we need and the accelerations we need that need to be part of our conversation. Sorry, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, it's one other thing that comes to mind is that you have some actors that control really large tracts of lands and others that have very small ones, but that are very numerous. And one of our focus in our carbon methodologies is to try to make carbon crediting accessible for the smallholders and for the pe so many people on the ground that actually do control a large fraction of the land that, that needs to have action on it, um, but don't have the business skills to um, access credits in the way that we currently do. And I think also, you know, the, the, it's different with those stakeholders. Uh, there's different ways to build coalitions. There's kind of different procedures. And, and we have to have both. We have to embrace all actors, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there are different strategies to use. A lot of the field-based work with smallholders, with communities, is about demonstrating, showing it can be done. And you gain momentum that way. Mm -hmm. um, that's how farmer managed natural regeneration really spread throughout. Niger, for example, just neighbors seeing neighbors doing these good practices. That's great. Okay, we're going to close the questions. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing your expertise. Round of applause, please, for Michael and Shari. Thank you. And now we will go to Yi Li. Hello. Uh, welcome. Come on up. We'll give you a handheld mic if that's okay. Um, we have one here. And um, uh, so, and uh, Yi, you're going to give us a, a, a keynote on terraformation and scaling natural yes. climate solutions. So yes, that's right. Over to you. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for coming Aloha. out <laughs> uh, to learn about terraformation. So I've only got, I think, seven minutes today. That's right. Um, and really, my message is actually not for the folks in this room. I mean, if you've taken the time to come to Climate Week, you're kind of just preaching to the choir a bit here. So really, for folks who are going to watch this online, and really for all of your friends, I have one key message today. Um, and that is, there is actually hope that we can get this done. Like, we, we're going to do this, right? We have it within our means. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and what Terraformation is doing, and hopefully you walk away with a concrete example of actual progress that's happening on, on climate change. Um, so I said my name is Yi. I come from Silicon Valley, if you don't know my background. Um, I was a serial entrepreneur. I used to work at companies like PayPal, helped build that company, launched four other companies. Uh, I've worked at brands like Google and Skype and Facebook. And uh, if there's one thing that, that you learn in Silicon Valley, it's really how to scale things, how to take like the small kernel of something. Uh, it's a search engine that's got a I feel lucky button on it, or it's like a, a website that's like blue and, and white and, you know, just looks at, lets you look at, you know, your, your classmates' uh, pictures and suddenly turn that into something that actually serves billions and billions of people, right? And, and the way that Silicon Valley does that is by focusing on bottlenecks, right? It's, and it's sometimes sort of a, a painful uh, practice, right? But if you really sit down and look at any system and just try to figure out what is holding back progress, what is holding back scale, what is holding back more users, what is holding back just, you know, increased growth uh, in an area, then I isolate those, figure out how to knock down those bottlenecks, and that's how you continue to scale and grow a system. That's really what like, the religion of engineering in Silicon Valley is all about. Um, so in 2019, uh, I, after spending 25 years in technology, um, my oldest kid was 12 in that year, and boy, when you have teenagers, that really, really strikes you know, home in, in your heart when you start to have conversations with them about what they're gonna do with 
in their future. And so I, I made a shift. I just, I, I had to go focus on climate. I made a pledge to, to myself and to, to colleagues to spend the rest of my working life uh, working on climate change in, in that year. And so that's, that's when I got together with some ex-colleagues from Silicon Valley and founded Terraformation. Um, so Terraformation is focusing on, on trees. It's one part of the, of the solution. Um, we think it's a big part of it, changing in land use and the gigatons of carbon sequestration capability there is a, is a really big part of the, of the analysis that you just saw. So in order to scale up tree planting, right, in order to reach a mission of gigatons and gigatons of carbon sequestration through nature-based solutions and afforestation, what does that take? Well, it's going to take around a trillion trees getting planted. It's going to take around three billion acres of net new forest to get, to get planted and to, and to be maintained over the next several decades. Okay, that's a really big number, right? How do we do that? So our, our research led us to talk to some of the very largest tree planting organizations in the world, organizations like TIST, Eden, We Forest, Global Forest Generation, Reforest Action. These are, these are some of the folks that we've partnered with and done research with. And what we quickly have identified is a set of bottlenecks that hold back global forestry. And they're really pragmatic things. They're not, they're not mysterious things, right? If you're trying to plant a trillion trees, well, you don't wanna have to like keep replanting the same trees over and over again. You want a tree to go in the ground and then be able to self-maintain and self-regenerate, right? Survive in, in, its, in its natural biome. So you wanna pick native trees. Okay, if you wanna pick a trillion native or endemic species, do we have enough seeds? For a trillion, you're going to need multiple trillions of seeds. Uh, no, the world does not actually have multiple trillions of native and endemic tree species stored up today. But we can do that. There's a practice called seed banking and seed supply that we can we can optimize to, to try to unblock that bottleneck. Uh, the world does not today have enough trained foresters. Just people, right, vocationally trained to be able to understand tree species and how to plant them and what the right spacing between uh, trees is, getting out there, putting the trees in the ground, managing nurseries, right? It's a vocational skill that can be taught. We don't have enough of these folks yet, but there's, there's things that we can do about that. Terraformation has Terraformation Academy, for example, on our website, uh, free training courses in seed banking, seed collection, nursery management, right, that are just uh, freely available to the world for, for downloading and watching. Um, just one, one start of a solution there. Uh, the world needs a lot more uh, technology for project tracking and project management, right? If you're gonna run a forestry project, you need to keep track. How many seeds, right, have you got? Okay, so, and then finally, uh, finance. Right? We need money to, to be able to start these projects. Right? So what Terraformation is offering to the world is an accelerator that combines all four of these uh, bottlenecks into, into one solution. Um, we help small teams get off the ground. We use uh, corporate and enterprise financing to incentivize their growth. Um, and we train them, equip them to become uh, uh, successful carbon foresters. Uh, in their regions of the world. We've done this 14 times in the last two years, have produced uh, four commercially viable forestry teams, and we're now scaling the solution across Central America, West Coast Africa, Southeast Asia, and, and New Zealand. And this is a model that's replicatable. This is a model that works from Silicon Valley. We know that technology startups uh, have, have applied exactly this kind of roadmap to, to be able to reach an, an, an entire ecosystem where now people think of starting uh, a technology company as a, as a viable career path. This generation that's coming up, we, with, with all of your help, we can create a career paths in forestry, career paths in carbon forestry, and create a generation of forest entrepreneurs that will help us all collectively solve this problem. Thank you so much. A round of applause for you today. Thank you. Um, we'll come to questions at the end okay, for you, right. if that's OK. You. But I want to say thank you. And thank yeah. you, Exponential Roadmap, for putting together such a fantastic panel. So we're hearing from academics, uh, entrepreneurs who are scaling by identifying bottlenecks, and now I'll pass to uh, Johan and Jenny, Johan Falk, uh, ERI, and Jenny Ireland from Women Business, because you're going to walk us through some of the corporate principles for establishing nature-based solutions. Thank Over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much. You can hear me, right? Okay. Yeah, so this is really an excellent roadmap, incredibly important, because it does not just focus on the challenges we have, but actually the solutions. And also the urgency and the need to scale exponentially. And uh, we represent uh, work uh, with businesses, the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, 
Okay, we have companies um, with a revenue of around $900 billion as members, and we in business also have a large network of companies. And I think the key point is how can we now activate the companies to, uh, to implement this roadmap? So that is what we talk a little bit about, because we, we are really in emergencies. We need to move as quickly as possible. We actually launched this uh, playbook yesterday, so we already started to integrate nature together with climate as part of this playbook for companies on how they should align their strategies and action with the 1.5 ambition. So we already will drive that with all the member companies immediately. But we're also working together on something we call corporate guidelines for natural climate solutions together with Women Business Coalition and Exponential Roadmap Initiative. Uh, we will give you a few highlights of that uh, shortly. It will be released shortly as well. But um, please, over to you, Jenny, and give a few highlights of what it will include. Yeah, thank you. So Women Business Coalition and our partners recognize the critical role that companies need to play in meeting our net zero ambitions. And so with that, one of the things we try and do is help define what leadership looks like and then give assistance and solutions to help companies deploy against that. So that's what led us to these guiding principles around natural climate solutions, which really just have, I'm gonna go through kind of five points, some of which are gonna be super familiar. So one, of course, we need companies setting net zero commitments through things like the Science-Based Targets Initiative, the Climate Pledge, and if you're a small and medium-sized business, the SME Climate Hub, which we partner with Exponential Roadmap and others on. So that's the place we need companies to start, right, is to set that commitment to really look to have emissions by 2030 and to get to net zero by 2050 at the latest. The next step is also pretty straightforward, right? We need companies to reduce their emissions. So reduce emissions in their operations and in their value chains and especially in their value chains, having a focus on nature where that's applicable. And so doing things like we heard about in the, the um, talk Michael just gave um, around really looking at the management of land, the restoration of land and the protection of land. So in the management space, I think in particular, looking at things like reducing methane emissions, looking at how you're managing cropland, fertilizer use, um, deploying, soil health practices that are really going to help not just climate mitigation, but resilience of farmers. Also looking at things like eliminating deforestation from supply chains is critically important, trying to do that as fast as possible. Um, and also looking at engaging in things around jurisdictional approaches to deforestation, like the LEAF Coalition, that are really looking at solving the governance issues and the legal issues that are necessary in tandem with those value chain engagements. Um, to find lasting solutions. The third point is probably the one that's a little more unusual, which is a call for companies to do all of that work in their operations and supply chains, but then also invest in nature in addition to that. And so we would love to see companies invest at least 10% of their unabated emissions in nature solutions, because we know one of the big bottlenecks, as you just talked about, is the amount of capital flowing to farmers to ranchers and to foresters to deploy the practices that are necessary to better manage the land and to reduce emissions. And so we would love to see all companies do that. Some have, depending on the industry, the ability to go beyond 10%. We've got companies like Netflix and Salesforce who are already there taking those steps and we'd like to see many more join them. And there's resources out there to help. Um, there's groups like the NCS Alliance and BASCs that can provide companies with guidance on how to approach this. And we have guidance coming out from VCMI and ICVCM coming out soon that will help identify what is a good investment in nature and nature credits look like. How do you talk about that publicly in a credible way? So we're really excited to see that guidance coming soon. And then the last two pieces are really around your advocacy. So as a company, are you advocating for policies? Are your uh, lobbying efforts, your trade association memberships, your political giving, do those actually align with a net zero journey and are they doing things to really value and improve nature and land and 
to drive the things that we've heard about today. And then the last piece is around transparency and reporting. Making sure companies are talking about the actions that they're taking, that they're sharing that with stakeholders who want to evaluate how they're doing, but also so that their peers can learn from their journeys and hopefully sometimes their mistakes because we know sometimes mistakes are the best way to learn. So those are the kind of high level guiding principles that we'll be releasing soon um, and that hopefully can help drive more focus on the nature component of a net zero climate journey. Wonderful. Thank you. Stay there. Keep the floor for a moment, if you will. Um, so round of applause, please, for <laughs> Jenny. Um, and thank you for tying it all together with the guidance um, for corporates uh, in a very uh, actionable uh, way. So thank you for that. Now, um, Yi, would you do you want to come up again? Has anyone got any questions for Yi? And has anyone got any questions for anyone else? Uh, and again, if not, feel free to ask questions of the floor. Um, thank you. Or I will ask one. Okay. Oh, thank you. Solitaire, yes, please. Sorry. Hi, guys. Um, thank you so much for that. The idea of, uh, the, idea of the carbon law for nature is brilliant. The idea of getting people engaged is brilliant. The use of technology is brilliant. But I can't help but think that we are in a little nature bubble here having this conversation and that so much of the climate conversation is all tech, 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 tech. What, where's the big tech solution that's basically just going to suck it out of the air? Whereas, of course, nature is that tech solution. Um, it's had sort of, you know, four billion years of shakedown trials and it is far, far beyond beta. So what, what can we do to make the centrality of nature as a solution to be something which is absolutely the, the first thing that anyone talks about when they talk about climate change, rather than sort of the fifth thing, if we're lucky? Any more questions together? Otherwise, Jenny, do you want to take... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. I'll take two and then we'll... Sure, this, this one might be a little bit difficult. Um, I'm interested in why the, I, I'm really glad that we're focusing on solutions and we're focusing right on actionable targets in front of us, but I, nobody's kind of stepped out into bigger pictures. Like how are we going to democratically define what is socially useful work? Are we gonna talk about, you know, real monetary reform? You know, the financial constraints are something we fully own. That's a human-made constraint. The real constraints are thermodynamic and ecological. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I was really glad that you said like a price on carbon. But this is not a new idea. Yeah. Like it's incredibly interesting for how can these actors move the political message because in a new landscape, all of these things play out much differently than now. Right, I'm so pleased we brought the physics into it. There's not enough discussion of the second law of thermodynamics within sustainability. But your question is, how can we engage wider policy actors? Or just recognition of the complex issues. Jenny, do you want to start with the um, centrality of nature? Well, I mean, I think that's part of why we're doing the work that we're doing and releasing the guiding principles, because I do think nature has been somewhat ignored by the climate community, and it has been very focused on energy and other things, which make a lot of sense and sometimes are the easier things for many organizations to do, companies in particular. But I do think, like we heard from Michael, like we can't get to net zero without addressing impacts from nature. And so hopefully this is one of the steps to, to get us to really putting the emphasis on it like it deserves. Great. Uh, you, do you want to pick up on that one? <laughs> I, okay, true story. Yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, one, of, one of the slides in our venture capital pitch deck for Terraformation uh, actually said, if we were walking in here saying that we'd invented a technology that absorbs uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, completely solar powered, some poops out oxygen and sometimes food as a byproduct, <laughs> and is adapted to every biome on the planet, Right? You'd be throwing term sheets at us, right? But instead, right, like this is a billion year old, year old technology called a tree, uh, and it just suffers from a market problem. So, uh, and yeah, so it works. I think that pitch does resonate. But I think the solution really actually is in collective action. Um, and it's just driven by some of the economics that we heard about uh, earlier on, right? Uh, the, the people on the ground, people who actually determine land use with their own hands, they have a very strong economic incentive to do what's efficient for them, right? And so I think by creating this entrepreneurial incentive 
to engage in tree planting, to engage in reforest action. That's, that's actually how right? like we, we get to large numbers of people um, actually engaged in this. And just by, by, by their own you know, individual voting with their own two feet, right? that, that's how I think we, we get this to happen. That's also, I think, how we start to answer the second question. right? If we can get uh, large enough sectors of, of, a, of a local economy, Hopefully it's just 20 percent, but right. I, I think we can get to these tipping points and more, right? Um, if we can get to large enough uh, populations, right, of people engaged directly in and dependent on things like carbon pricing for their livelihoods, right, then you you start to have enough of a voting coalition mm -hmm. to shift politics around. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly right that we are in a moment of transition, aren't we? That we're kind of grappling with all these issues while we're even grappling with the nature of capitalism and our structures. So. Thank you for raising that. Johan, I'm going to pass to you to answer those two questions as you wish, but also give us a few closing remarks, and then we'll finish up. I think to, to succeed to your questions, we need, we need to reconnect with nature. And I think the sort of biggest mistake for humanity was when we divorced nature, basically. And I also think companies have an opportunity there as well to help us. Like, you exemplify to, to reconnect with nature. So I mean, if you can get as many people as possible to, to find a way back to nature will be incredibly important to keep nature close to your heart, really. And um, I would just say, I, I think it's an excellent roadmap. It's an excellent example that it is achievable to move exponentially. It is possible. And we need to use the sort of best practices from all other industries, you know, how we can actually achieve these tipping points and move much, much faster. I'm absolutely convinced it's possible. And we need to gather the actors, I think, around this vision and mission and just start to implement the roadmap, as far as I see it. So we're absolutely committed to work together with you and all of you, actually, too to move forward. That's great. So implement Thanks. the roadmap uh, and where nature goes to your heart. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. <laughs>